In the previous section, we described basic optimizations you should implement as basic programming practices for all FPGA VIs. By the end of this module, you will be able to define FPGA IO terminology. Okay, so now we're going to go to lesson 4, which is using FPGA IO. So as a quick overview, we're going to give you an introduction to it. We're going to talk about configuring FPGA IO. Then we'll talk about different IO types. We'll talk about using integer math using Compact Rio I.O. and how to handle FPGA I.O. errors. So on the slide on the top right, you see an example of an FPGA I.O. item. So FPGA I.O. items, they connect the I.O. to the FPGA logic. So this is the way that you'll get um, signals into and out of the FPGA. Each FPGA I.O. item has a type like analog or digital. So you might have an analog input that's coming into the FPGA, or you might have like a digital output that the FPGA is sending out. FPGA VIs can have multiple types of I.O. items. So they can have analog um, inputs, outputs, digital I.O. Uh, there might be several digital I.O. lines on a particular FPGA VI. If you go to the NI example finder, you can navigate to toolkits and modules, FPGA, Compact Rio, Basic I.O. if you want to take a look at some examples of different I.O. that you're using on a FPGA. So let's talk a little bit about FPGA I.O. terminology. So first, let's talk about a terminal. The terminal is the actual hardware connection. For example, on a Compact Rio module, you might have an actual pin for, uh, for a, a digital I.O. line. Next, we have an I.O. resource. So the I.O. resource is a logical representation in LabVIEW FPGA of that hardware terminal. So for example, in that previous slide, you saw an I.O. node, which is representing that particular, uh, possibly a digital I.O. line that's on your FPGA. And then lastly, you have an I.O. name. So in the LabVIEW project, you can assign that I.O. resource a name. So instead of just having it look like digital I.O. line 0, uh, it could be something like emergency stop line. And you can give it something that uh, makes a little bit more sense uh, and it makes your code a little bit more readable. Now you can define FPGA I.O. terminology. Next, we will add FPGA I.O. to a LabVIEW project and access FPGA I.O. in an FPGA VI. In the previous section, we defined FPGA I.O. terminology. By the end of this module, you will be able to add FPGA I.O. to a LabVIEW project and access FPGA I.O. in an FPGA VI. Okay, so let's talk about configuring FPGA I.O. So the way that you would add FPGA I.O. to your LabVIEW project could differ depending on what kind of target you're using. So if you're using Compact Rio, what you can do is you can detect the modules when you add your chassis. And this is an easy method because all the FPGA I.O. Will, will be added automatically. If you're using R-Series, what you can do is you can manually add FPGA I.O. When you're using R-Series, there's going to be a lot of lines typically. So by manually adding the FPGA I.O., you can select which exact FPGA I.O. channels you're going to be using in your project. So when you're adding a Compact Rio to your LabVIEW project and it's already on the network, what you can do is when you're adding it, it'll ask you, do you want to discover C-series modules? If you click discover, then what will happen is it'll go to your, the, the LabVIEW project will go to the Compact Rio, find out what modules are on there, and it will add, automatically add the FPGA I.O. Um, for those modules to your project. In this slide, we see how to add FPGA I.O. to a R-series project. So if we look over there on the left, we've got a project with a um, with the R-Series FPGA target. And to add I.O., you would just right-click that FPGA target, go to New, and select FPGA I.O. And that'll launch the window that you see on your right. So you can go through the different connectors and add specific lines um, that, that, that you're going to be using. And that's the way that you would add specific uh, FPGA I.O. to a R-Series project. And we'll see this uh, later in a demo. So in this slide, we see the FPGA I.O. palette. And this is where you would get 
functions and nodes that relate to I.O. So for example, you can place down an I.O. node, and that's the way that you would access the values of, of I.O. There's I.O. constants, methods, and properties, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. So here we see two methods of getting uh, that I.O. node on your block diagram. One way is you can place down an I.O. node from the functions palette, and then you can right-click it, go to uh, select FPJ I.O., go to Module 1, and then select the particular uh, Module 1 TC0 I.O. from your project. The other way you can do it is you can go straight to your Project Explorer and then find your I.O. So in this case, we found uh, and browsed to Mod 1 TC0, and what you can do is you can simply click and drag that onto your block diagram, and it'll be placed down there for you. So this is probably the easiest method to do it. Now let's go and take a look at this in a demo. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to demo is adding I.O. to an R-series board. So we can see in our project that we have an R-series board right here, a 7852R. And what we're going to do is add some I.O. to it. So right now, we don't have any I.O. listed in our project. But we can right-click and go to New. And we can go to FPGA I.O. to add our I.O. So I'm going to select this. It's going to pop up this window, and I can kind of navigate through the I.O. that's available on my R-series board. So I'm going to say... Let's say in this project I happen to be using AI0, and I also need to use uh, Digital IO0 as well. So now I've added these, I'm going to click OK. I notice that on my project I've added AI0 and DIO0 on Connector0. Okay. So uh, one thing that might be useful is AI0 is not super descriptive, so maybe I want to give it a more descriptive name. So I can right click here, or press F2 to rename. And instead of calling it AI0, I'm going to call this accelerometer 0. And then here, for digital IO0, I'm going to call this um, emergency stop. OK. So now I've got a descriptive name for my, uh, for my IO, and I'm going to go to a BI go to the block diagram, and I'm going to add my I.O. So I'm going to show you two ways of doing it. Uh, one way, uh, which is probably the easiest way, is you can just drag it straight from your project into your block diagram. And now I've got my I.O. here. The other way of doing it is you can right-click, go to FPG I.O., put down an I.O. node, and notice that it doesn't know which specific I.O. it's associated with, um, and you can left-click it, and then browse to whichever one you want to use. So in this case, I'm going to choose Emergency Stop. And now I've got an I.O. node where I can access um, the value of Emergency Stop. Okay. So let me just close this. And now I'm going to bring up a Compact Rio project. So now here I've got my Compact Rio project. And what I've done is I've added the Compact Rio. And I've automatically discovered its different modules. So notice that I've got module one here with this IO. I've got module two with some more IO. And I also got module three with some more IO. In this case, this one's uh, analog output zero. So let me go ahead and open this up. So um, let's say analog output zero. And I can rename that, maybe call this um, motor or something like that. So now I can just drag this from here, from my project into my block diagram, and I can start using it. Okay, and that's uh, that's pretty much it for adding IO for Compact Rio projects and also R series projects. Now you can add FPGA IO to a LabVIEW project and access FPGA IO in an FPGA BI. Next, we will describe different FPGA IO data types. In the previous section, we added FPGA IO to a LabVIEW project and accessed FPGA IO in an FPGA BI. By the end of this module, you will be able to describe different FPGA IO data types. So in this slide, we have an overview of different IO types that are available to you on FPGA. So here, uh, we've got a digital line, and that's going to write and or read a Boolean value to and from a digital line. So it's just it's, it's going to be one line, and you're going to be able to send it a true or false to either um, set that line or read the value of that line. Cool. We also have a digital port, 
A digital report is a collection of digital reports. So uh, if we take a look at that screenshot there, uh, we have a DIO port uh, control, which is a 8-bit unsigned number going into the DIO port 0 there on the I.O. node. That 8-bit unsigned integer is actually representing eight separate digital lines. We also have analog I.O. Uh, so this is going to allow you to read or write data from an analog channel. So in our series, uh, analog I.O. is going to be represented by integer values, and we'll talk about this more later. And Compact Rio will generally represent that using fixed point data types. There are also other I.O. types um, for, for other specific modules. So there are uh, motion Compact Rio modules out there, and those will have their separate I.O. type and also uh, CAN modules as well. So let's talk about digital I.O. So if you're wanting to set or read individual lines, then that's going to be using a Boolean data type. So each line can either go high or low, and that's going to be represented by a true or false Boolean value. A port is going to be a collection of lines. So it could be a collection of 8 lines or 16 lines. So with a port, you're going to indicate that with an integer data type. So if you're trying to do a port of 8 lines, for example, you would need to represent that with an 8-bit integer. Depending on your hardware, digital I.O. can be either unidirectional or bidirectional. So for example, um, you, you, you might have a digital line uh, with a particular module that only does digital output, or another one might only do digital input. Some hardware can do digital I.O. on each line, so each line can either do input or output. So if your digital I.O. line or port is bidirectional and you want to change the direction of the line or the port from the FPGA VI, there's a method for that, and uh, you would just select the set output label method and determine it that way. So later on this lesson, we'll talk a little bit more about I.O. method nodes. So here we have a slide talking about creating counters from digital I.O. So an FPGA does not have built-in counter hardware, so there's not going to be a, a counter line. Um, so if you want to implement a counter, you would have to program that in FPGA. The minimum input pulse width detectable is going to depend on the loop period and also your hardware. As fast as that loop is running, that's how that's how fast it's going to be able to detect a minimum input pulse. On some hardware, you can get improved performance by replacing the while loop with a time loop. So a time loop is going to be something called a single cycle time loop, and we'll talk about that in a later lesson. So let's take a look at this block diagram here. So what we see here is an implementation in FPGA for a counter, in particular a 16-bit rising edge counter. So let's focus on that top part for now. So on the top part, we're reading from the DIO zero line, and essentially what we're looking for is take a look at that greater than function. We're looking for a point where the top input is going to be true and the bottom input is going to be false, and that's going to represent a rising edge. So if you think about it, a rising edge is when that digital port, when that digital line goes from a false value to a true value, which is the same thing as it going from a, a low voltage to a high voltage. So every time that greater than function detects uh, a rising edge, it's going to go down to the bottom section of this code, and it's going to increment the count. So essentially, you'll see that in that U16 integer, we're, we're keeping track of a 16-bit count. Notice also that the, the loop condition terminal has an input of false, so this loop is just going to run forever. Also, if you look on the left side, there is a boolean for resetting, so if that boolean goes true, then it's going to reset the count back to zero. Let's talk about analog I.O. So different devices are going to have different default data types for analog I.O. So for example, if you're using an R-series device, uh, the default data type is going to be a signed integer. So you're going to have a 16-bit or 32-bit uh, signed integer, depending on uh, which, which device you're using. So for our series, that data is going to be raw. It's going to be calibrated, but it's going to be unscaled. So that 16-bit that or 32-bit number, if you want to convert that into engineering units, you're going to have to go from that, that number into uh, a, a voltage, so you'll have to do some scaling. And we'll talk about that more later. If you're using a compact Rio module and you're doing analog I.O., uh, generally you're going to get your data returned as fixed-point data, and this data is going to be calibrated already. So. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about fixed point a little bit later in some of the later lessons. If you need to do floating point operations or analysis, uh, you can either do this on the FPGA or you can also do it on the host.
describe different FPGA I.O. data types. Next, we will scale our series analog I.O. by using the integer map. In the previous section, we described different FPGA I.O. data types. By the end of this module, you will be able to scale our series analog I.O. by using the integer map. Okay, let's talk about using integer math uh, with analog input and analog output. So with, with our series cards, a lot of times what will happen with the analog input is it'll convert a binary representation of the voltage to a signed integer. So, so, so for example, uh, the analog input would, would be reading a, a voltage, maybe it's going from negative 10 volts to 10 volts. And then in the FPJ, it makes it into a binary representation of that. And if the if the uh, FPGA harbor for that is analog input with a uh, with with a 16-bit resolution, then it's going to use two to the 16 bits to to represent that voltage. So at that point, you have a binary number that has 16 bits of representation that is representing that voltage. Uh, what you can do to get that back into engineering units, one way you can do this is you can pass this raw, unscaled uh, binary data to the host VI for conversion to volts or other units. On the opposite end, with analog output, uh, you could start in the host VI, and then you can take an engineering unit of volts and then change it into a 16-bit binary representation and then you can write that binary representation of the voltage to the D to A converter of the analog output. So let's take a look at the numeric palette. So uh, a lot of the basic numeric functions on the FPGA target are still available to you. So you have addition, subtraction, and things like that. Let's talk about integer division. So if you're taking a divide function and you have uh, two integers going into that divide function, then it's not going to return an integer value. It's actually going to return a double precision floating point value, which is not supported on FPGA. So uh, you must use other functions for integer math. So one way you can do it is you can use the scale by power of 2, which we've talked about before, if you're dividing by a number that's power of 2, like 4. Or you can also use the quotient and remainder function. And that one is going to do the job, but it's going to take uh, a lot more FPGA resources. So in this slide, we have an example of doing some scaling uh, with our series in LiveU FPGA. So let's say we have an output coming out of that I.O. node. So uh, we're reading an analog input channel 0. And really what we want to do is we want to scale that by a factor of 0 0.7. So 